This is Tara from Pop Culture Classroom. Um, today we are going to be working on comic book composition. Um, I want you guys to look at this comic book panel and drop into the chat everything that you think makes this comic book page up here a terribly composed comic book page. I want you to tell me everything that makes this comic bad. So, one of the first ones that came up in two different points, this is really poorly organized. And that makes it really hard for us to read. We don't know a lot of comics is communicating with your reader how you want their eye to move through the page. And this gives us no clues as to how to do it. Um, we usually in the West read from what we read from left to right and in the East they read from right to left. So it can flip depending whether you're reading manga or American comics. But uh, usually we know to kind of start and you follow it through and none of this leads you through it all. This one's up here. Oh, let me get another. I'm going to make a notation one. Here we go. This one's clearly panel one. And then you probably go there. But then here or here, uh, probably this one, then here. But then where does this guy fit in? Do you start with him or it gets really, really, really hard to know where to go. Um, so some ways that we could fix that. If we even just boop, straighten out these rows and move them around so that they became clear rows of comic like especially if I move these images down a little bit and everything, this would already make it a little bit clearer what goes first. Um, one of the other things that you want to keep in mind is that long panels like this guy, oop, doo -doo. long panels like this guy can be really difficult. Um, you want stacked panels like that to always be on the side that the person starts reading from, that that is the first panel they start with um, in its row. So it can be lower down on the page, but you don't want it to break up any rows and you want it to be the start of its rows. Um, so this would be okay how we have it over here if this were a manga, but with it being an American comic, you'd only want a long panel on this side. Um, some other things about this. It does not leave a lot of room for word panels, um, word bubbles. This one has some spaces, but for a lot of them, you would have to put the word bubble right on top of the person. Um, and some of this is words that if you don't know, we'll go over them a little bit more when we get specific. But yeah, you wanna make sure that you have room for where the dialogue is gonna go. If there needs to be stuff in the background, as I draw stuff in the background, <laughs> So it's not it's not very interesting. Um, it's also not very interesting in its subject matter, right? It's not that you can't have simple art, but simple art still needs to work. Um, if you look at something like Adventure Time, its simple art style matches the tone of the story. Um, so, like, I don't want to be like, oh, you have to draw great to be able to do a comic. You, you don't. Like, a lot of people make comics with stick figures, etc. But whatever style you have needs to support the story you have and add to it. Um, and sometimes that means maybe, maybe choosing a different story while you work on art skills, depending on what you want to tell. Um, but uh, that's why we're here, right? To get better at our art skills. Um, one of the other things... It's very boring, not just in the art, but it's showing the same imagery over and over again. And this is something called talking heads um, because it's fun to draw a human face. And it's, you know, it's a thing we want to draw. We want to draw Batman doing cool stuff. We don't necessarily want to draw like an alley in Gotham or a close up of his alarm clock or something. But those are the things that make the world feel more interesting and add variety to the imagery. If you just draw people's faces over and over again, like think about how boring a movie would be if it was just one close up of a person's face. Yeah, like there's probably a couple of stories out there that you could pull that off with. If every movie was like that all the time, it would be awful. Um, so make sure that your your panels are and what subject matter you choose in them, what imagery you choose to show supports what you're trying to show. Um, Another way you can add support is, and I took this off, you can add color. Color can help clarify things, make things more interesting. 
Um, you don't have to use color in a comic by any means. There are many amazing comics in black and white, but you want to choose whatever you choose because it supports the story you're telling. And that's something we're going to talk about a lot is that all of these choices that you can make in comics, they're to support what you're telling. Um, and with the color, it kind of brings out something that kind of slips by that is also really important in art. With color, you kind of notice that maybe this panel down here is a pretty important part of what's going on. Because if you don't have that, this is just two dudes arguing without any context, right? When you have this, it implies that whatever they're arguing about ends in a nuclear explosion, which suddenly makes this argument a big deal, right? But I've shoved this big deal into the corner with no context. You probably wouldn't even notice it. Or if you noticed it, it just wouldn't seem important. It almost looks like a stamp on the bottom of it. Like that's my artist signature. So one of the other things we want to talk about a lot as we move into talking about composition um, is the visual hierarchy, especially in comics. And visual hierarchy means giving more visual importance to the things that you want your reader to see and notice. And that's really pretty much everything composition is about. So technically, the composition is the placements or arrangements of visual elements in a work of art. Now that we're, we're eight minutes in, I'll give you the actual definition. Um, and that is talking about being really mindful of what you're putting into your art, how you're putting it into your art, and why you're putting it up to your art. And at first, this is going to feel kind of awkward because we have this really, I would hesitate to call it unhealthy, but it can become unhealthy for creative people. This feeling that art needs to come and flow naturally. And that's not true. And it's really not true with comics because comics are very, very, very much about communication. So you need to be tapping into things like common body language for characters and will eisner talks a lot in his comic storytelling for comics which i highly recommend um if you're interested in this subject about how well there's no official dictionary of human body language we understand it if i'm doing this even if there are no words of me saying like oh my god you know <gasps> something's happening i'm shocked i'm upset i do not seem to be happy or if i'm happy it's the kind of happy that's caught me really off guard like we build this entire in our head huge encyclopedia of words and meanings and the closer you are to someone of course the more common those words and meanings are for example when we talk about comic book vocabulary you guys probably if you don't officially know what a word balloon is can probably figure it out in the context of comics. And if you don't, it is, let me see if I can make one real quick here. Oh no, no, I cannot make one real quick. That's my, there we go. Nope, it's gonna be a backwards one. Here we go. They are these bubbles that say like, oh, I guess it should be over here. Now this implies that this person is talking and also interestingly implies that he's talking over that entire conversation because of the fact that I put the balloon over everyone talking. Um, so there's also always at play this literal and figurative in comics. Um, and we'll talk about that too. But let's step back a little bit and talk a little bit more about composition. Um, so like I said, it feels a little awkward at first because you have to stop and think about what am I trying to tell the reader and how am I going to tell it to them? And what does that physically mean for me as an artist putting together a flat piece of paper? Like if I want to tell someone about a dark and stormy night while I was scared, how do I bring that across on a flat piece of paper or a computer screen and make them feel that? And luckily with comics, we have so many tools to do that. Um, and one of the first ones I'm going to talk about, which isn't necessarily unique to comics, is the golden ratio. And as you can see, it's not very unique to comics. It is actually not even unique to art. It is something that nature does. And ugh, I didn't even think about it. All my examples are artistic, but you can plug it into Google and you'll see natural ones. It is just this ratio 
that shows up in nature and science and human bodies. Like you can see the Mona Lisa's face, but every face breaks down into it farther and farther and farther and farther. And we love it because we see it so often. We don't really know why it comes up so often, if it's just chance or whatever. But because we see it so often is very appealing to us. And one of the things, the way we translate it into art, and actually these are not necessarily the best examples of that, weirdly. Um, sorry about that. But it pretty much means that you don't want to just put everything right in the middle. Um, and you can see that. The Mona Lisa, even though she's in the middle, her face is tilted up. Um, well, Jesus is in the middle. The bulk of people are to the side. The bulk of the Eiffel Tower is at the bottom. So a good rule of thumb to follow this, instead of having to remember a 1 to 1.618 ratio, a lot of artists think of it as the two-thirds rule. That you don't, you put... The emphasis of whatever you're doing in one third of your picture and the other two thirds are de-emphasized. And you can use this in everything from a giant, giant oil painting like these to every individual comic panel. But one of the things, again, you want to think of in comics is that you are not just making each individual panel work together. You're also making the page work together. So you want to balance how much emphasis goes into each individual panel versus how much goes into the uh, page as a whole. And one of the best ways to do that is to lean again into that visual hierarchy. If the most important part of this page is the nuclear explosion, that should be the biggest part of the page. That should have a whole at least third to itself. And then within its panel, it would also probably want to be divided into thirds because I would want to make that panel the one that drew people in the most. Um, and that's the way I, a lot of times, as a comic book artist, think of it. As I look at the page, what is the most important per thing for someone to take from this page? And that is what I build my composition around. Is what do I want them to think about the most as they read through this? And there may be other stuff that floats in and out. Um, dialogue that's happening too, things that are happening. But when you know what the most important thing is, that is going to make your compositions come together and help the story the most. Um, and this is also, if there are any writers out there, this is why it is a very good reason your artists, your editors, they are not your audience. They are creators with you. You want to give them the script so that they know that that MacGuffin that turns up in chapter one is important and should be seen in the background the whole time. You don't want to surprise them at the end because then it won't be built into the background of your comic the whole time. So, all right. Uh, all right, let's talk a little bit more about really specific parts of composition to comic books. Um, so this isn't just necessarily general, although all of it will kind of help you in general, but this is specific to comic books, and we're going to use our worst page here ever because it does have what we need to talk about. So one of the first vocabulary words that I want to bring up that only goes to comics is again, and I'm going to put a less huge example up here. Like, oh, I want it to be like, there we go. I don't know. I put it right on that guy's face again. See, and this is the problem. He has, there's too much. Here we go. I can put one here. This uh, program I'm using, by the way, is Clip Paint Studio, and it is awesome for making comics. Um, I highly recommend it. So this is our word balloon. All right. And there are also different variations of a word balloon. Sometimes you'll see ones with, this is gonna look kind of messy for a minute. You'll see ones with like, kind of cloudy tails. And that means it's a thought balloon. Like, why are you not clicking down? Oh no, they're thinking forever. My pen is not. <laughs> that is not how you want your tail to look. The tail should point to the person who is having the thought or saying the word. Oh no. All right, my, my stylus is not great on my... Oh, okay, let's try a mouse. There we go. Oh no. <laughs> um, don't let it go. All right. Okay, so that is a thought balloon. Um, there is also, if you do kind of a... I don't know. Something like this. 
it is a caption box so that has like out of character information like the date the location if there's a narrator uh, Deadpool will talk to his audience and break the fourth wall on that so those are some things that you can use to uh, add text um, to communicate but they're also things that you want to think about in your composition you got to give room for them you don't want to make the most beautiful piece of art and then have it covered up by a big old word balloon because that character is giving a page long monologue and you didn't think to make room for it. Very sad. I've had it happen a couple times. Never again. Um, uh, sorry, had to take a drink of water there. Another thing to think about is the transitions, or I mean, excuse me, the gutters. The gutters are. Oh, wait, actually, let's do it first. Panels. The panels are the little pieces of art. Um, they can be open. All of these are closed panels, but you can also have open panels where they don't have defined edges. They can bleed off the edge of the paper. You can get all sorts of creative with different shapes. The one thing to keep in mind, though, is it's really fun and you can get really, really creative. And I really, really emphasize that you should. But don't put uh, the bells and whistles before the story. Like, you want your page to be beautiful and memorable only after it is understandable and helps support this story. Um, if you can balance both, that is amazing. That's like saga, and that's at what everybody aims for. Um, and hopefully we'll all get there, but I know I'm not there yet. So don't feel bad if you're not there yet. Um, um, but uh, the panels, you can build them up, and what goes in between them are the gutters. And... I want gutters people don't think about a lot, but I really want you guys to stop and think about the gutters for a minute because the gutters are these places in between the comic. So all this stuff here. Some comics have them black, some comics have them white, some comics will change it like a flashback might have like fuzzy colored gutters like a pastel color or if they're in space they might have different colors but they're everything that goes between the panels and why they are really important is because comics is one of the few two-dimensional medias that uses time and your time passes between the gutters and we're about to transition into talking about transitions but all those transitions they happen here between the gutter you, as the creator, decide whether this is one second or a million years. Obviously, in this comic, it's not a million years, although that would make this a very different, interesting comic, wouldn't it? Um, but you control it. You can literally go from, from the far distant past to the far distant future in that gutter. And like I think a lot of people don't think about their gutters a lot. Understandable. But they're really important. They're kind of what makes comics comics um and with that we're going to move into talking about some of those transitions that you can use because i think there's something again we don't think about a ton that are really the heart of the of comics and i'm going to pull up so the other book i recommend if you want to be a comic book artist is scott mcleod's set of understanding comics i think it's create Understanding Comics, Creating Comics, and Reinventing Comics, or I believe what they're called. Um, and this is from uh, Creating Comics, uh, which is the best one for comic creators. <laughs> and what he's talking about is what the distance is between the panels. And he has some great examples. The distance of time. So first, we have moment to moment. And that is just... You can see from these examples, just moving a little forward, moving a little back, blinking your eyes. It is literally the smallest amount of time. The next one is action to action. So that is when you're going from, as you can see, swinging for the bat, hitting the bat. Not a lot of time passes, but you're moving a little bit forward. You don't have to see the whole thing. The next one is subject to subject. So you're still kind of, you're staying in the same scene. You're not moving. Um... <coughs> But you are moving around the scene and looking at different things. Um, and one of the interesting things between these three, we have three more to talk about, but these three really exemplify this, I think, a lot. The more time you put between your panels, the faster the pace of the comic moves. The more, the less time you put, 
the tenser it is. Now, of course, you don't want to stretch out tension too, too long or people will get boring and you don't want to go too, 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 too action or people will never have time to breathe. So with these transitions, you don't want to think about it as like, oh, I'm always going to do action to action. No, you want to build it up. Um, I'm going to actually reference a movie here, but movies and comics, it's not a bad thing to compare to each other, even though comics, I think you have a lot more control and a lot better budget. I mean, dang, I can, I can build my budget for my comic cosmic entities. Heck yeah. Um, but, um, in the first alien movie, the, the, uh, the beginning goes very between moment to moment. And then I'm going to skip a little bit ahead. This one called aspect to aspect number five, which is when you look between parts of the same scene to build mood. And that helps us feel very tense and very like stretched out and so anxious that what, by the time they start coming alive, we are already there. So it's not necessarily that you want only to stick with one, even if you're within a genre. Like Alien is very much, well, it's a suspense movie too, but an uh, action-y movie. And there are times when it's going boom, boom, boom. And that's right. But those parts are so meaningful because of these long, drawn-out, tense scenes. <sighs> All right, let's talk about these three now too. Uh, number four is scene to scene. So that's when you're, you know, changing scenes, changing locations, um, just the story's moving ahead, something's changing. These can also be your hangers. Um, and that's all of these. They are not separate from the story. You are using them always, always, always. I'm going to say this like a million times, but it's always holding in together to make the story stronger. The writing and the art, all of it is to come together. And that's, that's the strength of comics. That's why I hit it so much, is you get to pull all these things together to make this one thing that hits on all these literature and art and a lot of movie techniques and visual, and it just all comes together. I'm starting to sound start redundant. Sorry, guys. Um, aspect to aspect, again, is like looking between parts of the scene. It's building it up. Um, these are a lot more popular in manga, although they have become a lot more popular partly because of the popularity of comic uh, manga in America. Um, but that's not to say there are also very, very many American comics that use them. But if you are not familiar with them, they come up a lot in, in manga where it'll just like, here's the, you know, the wind blowing through the trees and here's uh, the cicadas making their summer sounds. And here's this puddle that's evaporating because it's so hot. And you have like a page of that and you're just like, man, I, it's too hot. And you're not even there. Um, all right. And then the last one is non sequitur. And honestly, outside of some very specific genres, non sequitur does not get used a lot. Um, it means that the two things don't have anything in common. Um, and especially because in comics, a lot of times just by putting two panels to next to each other, you are assuming they're in common. So like, for example, this first one, because I'm so trained to read these together, in my mind, this is coming for them or something. Um, and that is why non sequiturs don't show up a lot. Um, but when they get, can get pulled off well, they work very well. A lot of times, like dreams, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, they don't really, panel one to panel two, have, have little to nothing to do with each other. So those are six kinds of transitions. Um, and when you combine those with your subject matter, with how you're framing it, with using those things like the golden ratio and all of that, all of them kind of layer together to start building your, your thumbnails for your comments. Um, let's see. Get my note. Okay. And all of this, all of these tools in your toolbox are so that you can lead your reader through your story. And another real cool thing about specifically being the comic book artist is you literally control every visual in that comic. Like, if I am looking at a comic drawn by Mike Mignola, gosh, I hope I didn't say his name wrong, every line in that comic every wood grain is in his style he defined everything in it every person's face is in his style the lines and the clothing are in his style 
he has defined the entire world. And I don't think anything actually can quite in depth is that some animated movies like i definitely say like into the spider-verse has that vibe um which is why i think a lot of it was so successful but even like action movies like sin city you still have actors who look the way they look that you're working with whereas in a comic book like you literally control everything and that can be intimidating and i know it can um but it's also a gift um and it all comes down to all the choices you make what colors you make the gutters, what what size panels. And I know this all seems really intimidating to have just taken it in half an hour. And like I said, it feels really awkward at first planning things so much. But in the end, it's going to make your story stronger. And it does get a lot easier as you go. And one of the tools, we're going to kind of transition into a... Uh, into a comic example now before taking some questions um but one of the real tools that i'm going to show you first that i want you guys to think about is thumbnails and thumbnails if you haven't done them are something that a lot of people don't think are a lot of fun but i think they're pretty fun um <laughs> just from teaching a lot of people are like oh i don't want to do it but pretty much what it is is figuring out a way to Get your ideas down fast enough that you can look at different ways of doing things and figure out what works best before you put hours and hours of time into making the anatomy perfect and the perspective right and stuff like that. So we're going to start. I'm going to go ahead and draw thumbnails of the same scene. First, trying to give you a distant feel, like kind of like an omnipresent or, uh, you know, just like watching the scene happen and unroll from a distance then from a very intimate feel um and it's we're going to do a racer starting a race so what does it feel like to be that racer and then kind of a mix trying to pull the best of both worlds and we'll see which one is best which is what you're doing with the thumbnails you pick out which one worked best and then i'll go ahead and ink it and wrap it up so with the first one let's see oh no we'll come down here I want to show every everything is about nothing is about mood. Everything is about clarity and communication. So I want first to make it. I would probably want to do the stadium. Actually, I'm going to do my thumbnails in blue. A lot of people will do their thumbnails in a different color, um, partly so that they can draw on top of it and have it stay that color. Um, oh my, I just think it looks nice also. Oh, yeah, we're going to have, like, we'll say this is, like, a high school track meet. I don't want to go crazy. So here's some, like, bleachers. The race thing. We're setting it up to be really recognizable. Put our racers there. Do to do people in the audience. So maybe it's a sunny day. Wow. Okay, so clearly a racetrack. And then we have the track guy. I like the like starter guns. I think he's going to have a hat. I think they have hats. I was on swim team. I maybe should have. Oh, well. And then... Okay, forward. It's the gun. Starter gun. Ah. They all run. Wah. And you notice I'm doing it at stick figures. I'm not worrying about it looking good. Honestly, this looks a lot nicer than my personal thumbnails so that y'all can know what's going on. They only need to really look good to you so that you need to know what's going on. Hopefully you guys can tell what my stick figures are doing and the reason is because you want you are making we're making three i usually don't do a couple but if you get stuck on a debt idea you might be doing a bunch so you don't want to be putting too too much time into every one now again comics you want to do real fast because you're doing 21 pages of comics 
if you're using this technique for an oil painting that's going to be a single painting that you're going to be sinking six months and two hundred dollars of supply into you might want to do some thumbnails that are a little bit more intense and use color and stuff like that um but for comics you're going to be doing 21 pages a week or 21 pages a month if you're doing a professional comic you do not want to forget or to be doing 40 minutes on every panel thumbnail so don't don't worry about these looking nice and pretty what you want to focus on is that it is clear what's happening that you have decided in the composition where the big things are, that everything the viewer needs to see is there, that you are drawing things you are wanting to draw. That is a very, something that comic artists, that all artists I think forget. If you hate drawing cars, don't pick up a comic that has a lot of cars. You control the panels. If somebody's having a conversation in front of a car, you have every right to crop it as much as you want to cut the car out as much as possible. Draw that car once in the first panel, and from then on, you draw, you know, the bumper. And that is totally something that you not only can, but should do in comics. Um, another thing, not that some people love doing backgrounds. Some people hate doing them. I love doing them um, most of the time. Some backgrounds I hate. But a good background takes a lot of time. So you want to be picky and choosy where you put one in. Um, so like, for example, a lot of artists will start at the beginning that they have one really good. Um, that they have one really good uh, background and then the rest of the page, they'll just kind of reference it with bits and pieces. So like you draw the whole school and then you just draw a kid at their desk or a teacher at a chalkboard. You don't have to draw the whole classroom and the whole school and the whole hallway every time. You can just be like, oh, here's a locker. They're in high school. All right. And so those are our thumbnails for distance. We're kind of seeing everything. Everything's really clear. It's also very upfront. It doesn't have a lot of mood built into it or anything like that. So that is our thumbnail for that representation of it. Now let's try the same idea of a race starting, but let's make it super moody and super like intimate about the racer's experience. I think I'm going to get rid of this. Note. I haven't needed that at all yet. So like... I'm going to start, let's see, with like the racer sweating. No, you know what? Let's even go. We're going super moody. Let's even go way closer. Some like sweat, not like sw not like jokey sweat. He is actually really stressed. And then we're going to go in. We still want to show. It's just going to be, I think they have, I think. Like, they're weird, like, at the end. But this is just the starter gun. Like, waiting, the tension of it all. Maybe we can even, if we want to make it, we'll have our, like, protagonist here watching it, ready to, like, run. Oh, that's a terrible... like all the others are kind of like fading into the distance as he focuses on the pop gun and then it goes off and we're just going to have like his eyes he like runs <sighs> okay so that is very moody you very much get the feeling of like he is so intensely about this race da 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 it is also not very clear like just those three panels out of context it's like what is going on it could be a lot of different things so what well, we've got a mood that mood has come at the suffering of clarity so i want to kind of balance these out a little bit more and for that i'm going to do a mix thumbnail so in this I'm going to take what I liked best from my first thumbnail and what I liked best from my second thumbnail and I'm going to combine them together. 
So let me get that open. There we go. So I really like starting with this like idea of this close up on his face a little bit before you know what's going on. But because of that, I want to combine the second panel with the idea of showing that it's a whole race. So we're going to kind of do. I like standing here, but it's not just going to be him. We're also going to show the racers so that you know that my race postures. That's what's going on. That it's a race. And I still think that, well, uh, this has made it a lot clearer that it's a race. I also want to do a little bit more to make it feel a little bit more like a group activity. So I think what I would do is maybe come from the back of his head so that I'm getting a different kind of angle shot and show like all the crowd and all he has to race ahead of them. All right. So now I have three different versions of this and I even sent this to print so I could still pick what I like and move it around and choose. Um, or I could just go with one of these. Um, and in my experience, usually the first thumbnail you do is not the best, but it's the idea you have most in your head. The second one you do is a little bit forced because you're like, oh, or maybe it comes real quickly, like the second or third, they might come quickly or they might feel forced, but they're just kind of getting out more ideas. And then it's like the third or the fourth one where you're like, oh, oh, actually, you know, now that I've thought about this a different way, I do like that better. Although sometimes I also, there are a lot of times when the first idea I have is the best one and that's what I go with. Um, but it's just a really good way to get into practice of planning out what you're doing beforehand, making sure it works. Nothing sucks more than drawing a whole comic book page and then realizing that you didn't put enough panels in the page or you didn't put the, enough room for word balloons. So laying this out, planning your composition ahead of times. It helps you technically and it helps you creatively by helping you pick out the clearest and most interesting imagery to draw. All right. And I think I really lost something not this. I think that I would really want to add this I one in two as like the last panel. But for now, we're just going to go and I'm going to. Now that I have it and I like it. I'm going to start going in and sketching it and actually making it look nice. Now, these are my pencil sketches. These wouldn't be my final inks. But you get enough time, I'll do that as well. But now I'm going to start going in and making it actually look like my character and double checking that the anatomy all works. And this is not necessarily the best drawing I've ever done. Sorry, guys. He's really sure of himself. He's gonna win. Damn. Bulk of this guy. And likely when I would color this, because this guy isn't important. I would also probably like desaturate him, put him a little bit in shadow, maybe even just color him like gray so that he didn't distract people because he is in the foreground. So that is, I'm telling them in one way that he's more important. So if I use color, I would use the color to tell people less important to be like, no, 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 go back to what I'm looking at. So you don't necessarily have to be stuck that if you use a tool one way, like, oh, I can't put anybody in the foreground except the main character, or else people will think that they're the main character. It's not necessarily like that. You just want to keep them all there. It's like a, if you've ever arranged like a music synthesizer and you're balancing out the bass and the treble and everything, it's not all one or the other. Sometimes this goes up for this song, and sometimes this goes up for this song. The same thing in art. Sometimes 
this importance. You know, sometimes you're using the visual hierarchy of color and sometimes you're using the one of harmony and sometimes you're using pattern and sometimes you're using pattern and color. It's always going to be changing. And which ones you use also, that's sort of what starts making your art style. Like I, we talked about Mike Mignola, his art style is very defined by his color palette, the way his lines look. I, my deepest apologies to any track stars who are here. You know what? Another very important art tool that I am being a butt and forgetting. I don't know what someone kneeling at the beginning of a race looks like, so I'm going to pull out my thing and I'm going to hit Google and I'm going to look at track race start. Look at that. So I'm going to get a reference photo, po reference photo and I will pull it over here. And, um, okay. So, reference photos. I'm kind of being a jerk right now. I'm using a stock photo, which you really shouldn't use without getting it from the company. But, uh, <laughs> Photo references are a great thing to use. Just make sure you're using them even, and this will be fine because I'm not, I'm not going to recreate this picture exactly, right? And that's what you want to do. They are tools to help you. They are not, they are not the solution. And the closer that you get to whatever reference photo you use, the more it should be yours because the more it is the art. So like if I were to paint this exactly and try to make it look exactly like that, I would definitely owe this photographer a lot of money because that's his piece of art that I just replicated in another media. Um, I don't think I'm really replicating this at all, though. So. All right. This one's definitely not going to get inked. Now with my pencils, I usually would be spending a lot, lot more time on this. But this is when you're working out, getting your expressions right, getting your anatomy right. Um, getting the, you know, the details on what the pop gun looks like, what a, what a, that kind of hat looks like all those things that's what you're figuring out in your pencils they don't need to be perfect but unlike your thumbnails you should be able to show your pencils to say, the person who wrote the comic or your sibling or your friend and they should be able to know everything that's happening in it now i because of the way i work do lean a lot more into looser pencils and more intense inks. Oh, this guy, look at him. He's not. Look at him. He is not ready for this race. Like, oh no! <laughs> that's that's how I felt at the beginning of sprints. Okay. <laughs> oh, I wish I was this wonderful person, Bob Ross. This finish line there. I'm using a little one point perspective, so that means everything is going to a point in the distance. It all come. And that is to make my my reader fill the length of it. 
like how far this person has to run. Actually, and I think, whereas I originally said I wanted there to be, like, a lot of audience, now that I've, ink I've sketched that in, I think I really want to let it be about the finish line. And I think I'm actually, even because of that, going to pull this down a little so that it says finish. And that is another thing to keep in mind with comics. You are editing until you send it off. Um, now, if you're working with a team, obviously you need to run a lot more choices past everyone. But yeah, don't ever be afraid to edit if something's working better, like yours. If it works better, go for it. Like, all right. In art, there are very many rules, and at the same time, there are absolutely no rules. And that's what you want to keep in mind. <laughs> You know the rules so that you can break them. And one of those rules is, yeah, if you want to edit until you're done, you edit until you're done. So uh, you guys were talking about digital versus uh, analog or traditional comics. Generally, I would say that they, it's not. It's really about what you want it to look like. Um, I have seen amazing, like, really basic handmade comics all the way up to, like, um, Orchid from D.C. by uh, J oh, James Keen. No, yeah, I think is the right last Dave Dave McKean um every page is like an oil piece of art like museum quality absolutely stunningly gorgeous art I do kind of have the problem with it if that makes the story a little bit more obscure but oh my god probably some of the most gorgeous art art in a comic I've seen um so so, so, oh no, sorry, so, I'm trying to get so, back into the chat room oh no. so I can see you guys sorry, and I, I open my sound. Sorry for that. Okay, I think I'm going to be uh, turning that sound down away. Um, so yeah, I don't, there's definitely nothing that's like one or the other better. It depends a lot on you and your art and like I love making them both ways. I will say the organization of digital does make life a little easier in some ways. Um, and if you like it, like Clip Paint Studio is like 60 bucks, but there are also tons of free ones like Krita and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, if you don't have access to it, it's also not like, oh my God, if you have this, you can't make comics. No, that's the greatest thing about comics is you can literally make amazing award-winning comics with a number two pencil and copier paper. Yeah, but layers, layers are definitely, I love them. And that's one of the things you guys can just see is I can turn down the opacity of the layer. So now when I go into ink on top of my pencils, I don't have to worry about erasing my pencils. I can turn down the opacity and then eventually just boop and they're gone and draw on top of them. Um, turning down the opacity is also a good way because a very common problem with um, layers is drawing on the wrong layer. If you have all of your layers either locked or at lower opacities, you can't ever draw on the wrong layer. So it helps me a lot with that. So I'm going to go ahead. If anybody has any questions, I am watching. Um, and then also all wonderful mods are watching. Thank you, Catherine and Matt. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and kind of work on inking this for the last 10 minutes and throw any questions. So I prefer actually this program for making comics a lot over photoshop there are some things that photoshop does that nothing else does um so it does depend on your needs but clip paint studio is pretty much they took photoshop and went what's important for making comics and nerdy illustrations etc cetera, etc cetera, and then they made all those tools more powerful. Like one of the things, let me see if I can show you guys this, like there's the stabilization thing. And this is so great because when I'm sketching, I can turn it way down and I get like quick sketchy lines. But when I want it to be really smooth, I can turn it up and then get these real smooth, slow, perfect lines. And that doesn't necessarily suit the art right now, but I do a lot of Art Nouveau illustrations. So there's like, 
long strands of hair and on paper I could, you know, have my glove and my extra piece of paper and steady my hand, but you can't do that on a computer. So it's just really good at matching all of those good, like closing that gap between the computer. Cause that is, there's lots of good tools. They are harder and more natural for you to use. Um, so I have, and I can kind of show you guys, I have an ancient Cintiq. So this is a Cintiq uh, HD 22. Let me I'm look at my thing. Okay. Yeah. And like this guy is old, very old. So I would not necessarily um, recommend him. Yeah, it's huge. I really like that it's a beast because I can like lean my whole weight into it. Um, Right now, honestly, if you're getting started and you haven't bought anything, I would strongly look into the iPad Pro with the pencil. I know a lot of people have a lot of success with that. And it runs Clip Paint Studio. You can also use Procreate on it, which is also a really great tool. Um, and um, that said, you can also get uh, different. Wacom is always going to be a good brand, always. Excuse me. They are also expensive. Um, there are a couple other brands like Huion, uh, Mono Price, that you can get pretty good, a lot cheaper ones if you look on like Amazon and stuff or Newegg. Um, I would, if you don't get the Wacom brand, Wacom software hates them. And you may think you have deleted the Wacom software, but Wacom software is one of those ones that like you'll have deleted out your Cintiq software and then like Adobe. Uh, uh, Adobe Reader downloaded like one Wacom connected thing and so it'll still like not work with the Qion software. So if you do get one of those and it's not like the driver isn't working, scrub, scrub, scrub your Wacom stuff because they like each other. But that's like nine out of ten work perfectly fine and then the tenth you just have to scrub. Can you get crit out? I don't know if you ha can have crit on iPad Pro. You might be able to. And crit, by the way, crit is another program kind of like this that is free to use. Um, the only thing you can get credit, Procreate though is like less than 20 bucks and I think less than 10. Um, and I don't know if you can have Krita. I think you can get Paint Tool Sci on there, which is also kind of a nice one. Um, does not have as much, it's more about painting, drawing than like panels, editing, that sort of thing. Like it can be, it does not have any text tool for example, um, but it's really great for making really beautiful art. So depending on which side you're falling on, like that's where I used to make my comics. Um, also, if you can't get this or say you love to work on Photoshop and that stabilization thing looked great to you, there's also this program which is like 30 bucks um, called Lazy Nizumi, which has, it does line smoothing, uh, pulled string I really like because it's like you're literally pulling your thing on a string. It does eclipses, uh, angles, parallel lines, all sorts of rulers that you can't because one of the hard things about computers is <clears throat> you can't just like lay a ruler down and do it. You have to have them in the program and some provide really great rulers and stuff and some do not. Oh, what other programs? Yeah, and I mean, Photoshop Photoshop is kind of the industry standard and it will always get you where you need to go. But it also just it's not just for comics. So it has, you know, you'll have every tool you need and then 5000 you don't. But that also depends on what art you're making. If you're a comic book artist who also takes your own photos of your models and also puts those photos up for a Patreon so other people can use them for reference photos, then yeah, you definitely want to lean towards Photoshop over Paint Tool Sci, which has no real photo managing skills. So really all the, the different programs are going to depend on what you do them for. Just for making tools, Clip Studio Paint has been... Oh my gosh. And you can, sh there's a 30 day trial of it too. Um, and it goes, it's like 60 bucks, but it also goes on sale for like half off, like every other week so like if budget is a problem it, it pops up fairly often pretty cheap and and you also once you buy it it's just forever with every update um 
you get them for free. And if you have a copy laying around somewhere, I guess that the code still works. Like if you got one in 2005 or whatever, you can still use it to get the current copy. So they are very supportive. Oh, also another resource that let me throw you at you while we have like four minutes is um, if you are working on your composition is, oh, uh, There is a website called Blambot, and I can actually, let me put this in. And they have free comic book fonts um, for indie, indie creators, even indie creators who are publishing their comics for profit. Um, and I didn't actually talk enough about font um, and word bubbles, but that can be a really big thing. So you always want to make sure don't don't use Comic Sans unless you're trying to make a point about using Comic Sans. And if you're like, what do you mean make a point about using Comic Sans? Then just trust me not to use Comic Sans. Uh, but uh, you can download different fonts there. And fonts and the way they are in your word bubble seems like such a little piece of the composition. But you really want to want to think it through. And it has some very simple rules. Um, the, the best way, honestly, to learn them would be to look at a comic book that has word bubbles that you like and sit down and spend an afternoon trying to learn how to recreate them. Um, trying to get the closest font, trying to get the layout right. That is the best way to learn how to do, how to do word balloons. Um, because that is something that's very important, but it also is a lot of, I didn't talk about it a lot because it's a lot of very tiny, subtle differences. Like, do you pick a font with a serif or without a serif? And serif. Do you pick a, do you draw your font by hand or do you, and like, they're all very important because the text is there all the time. So just be very mindful of making your text look very pretty. That is not the last thing you slap on last. I mean, it is the last thing and you do slap it on top, but like, it's not just a thoughtless thing to, to throw on there. Um... I do have, I don't know if this is what you meant, but there is a very useful, if you do get anything where you're drawing on the surface of your tablet, whether it's an iPad or like a Cintiq or something, um, get a paper fill cover. It makes drawing so much better. That like slippery, slidey feeling of your pens goes away and they're like 10, 15 bucks. Oh yeah, so that's just, that just ends up a lot of personal preference. So like I am part of an art group and my co-artist is that like I, she wouldn't she doesn't like this. So it's a lot of personal preference and it's just a lot of practice of training your kind of like playing a video game, training your hand eye coordination to to look at the screen and to be looking and letting your move your hand move uh, without. Um, <coughs> and. One practice you can do to make yourself better at that is called a blind contour drawing. So you take a pen and a piece of paper and you put the pen down on the piece of paper and you choose an object and you don't look away from that object and you don't lift up your pen and you just draw. Your drawings will look terrible. They're going to look like scribbly lines that don't make a lot of sense, but it helps build that up. And of course, when you're doing it on a screen, you're looking at the drawing so it does not look as terrible, but that helps train you to like move your hands separately from what you're looking at. Yeah, and if you look up like contour line drawing or blind contour line drawing, it's a pretty common drawing exercise to start out. And you can literally just, because like I said, your drawings aren't going to be pretty, so don't worry about it at the art. You can literally just sit there and doodle it. It's like you're watching TV or something. Just sit there with a notepad because it's really just about training your, your hand to move while you're not looking at it and your hand to replicate shapes you want while you're not looking at it. All right, I think we are done. Thank you guys so much. And I hope you have an awesome rest of your week and an awesome weekend. Bye.